I had to be in God's house. I, I wouldn't be nowhere else. I'd rather be nowhere else than right here. Amen. I appreciate that. Amen. Come to preach for us. Uh, Dr. Alfred Willis at Life Baptist Church down in St. Stephen's. And uh, we appreciate him, appreciate his dear wife, and uh, we love them. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Sorry, I believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher. All right. Thank you all for letting us come. I've mean, said that several nights, and I really mean that. And all the, all the goodness y'all have shown to us, we appreciate it. And it's been a joy to be here. Amen. And uh, I, I believe I got a little bit of mountain air in my lungs. Amen. In my throat. Amen. Is this the mountains? Are we in the mountains? We're somewhere. So I could tell a little raspy. I, I hate for y'all to listen to me <laughs> when my voice is not working good, but I, I, I had a touch of that this morning. I feel like I, that distracted me as far as preaching, but I hope you got something this morning. Amen. Well, it's a joy to be back. Thank you so much for letting us come and all the good things y'all have done for us, and we appreciate it from the depths of our heart. Amen. We've already said numerous times that good food and fellowship and nice, nice place to stay, amen, we'll spend the, the night there tonight and leave in the morning, and uh, supposed to be preaching down in Hartsville tomorrow, so we're looking forward to God helping us get there and preach tomorrow, amen, we have a low country, we call it a low country Baptist fellowship, and so every second Monday of the month, the preachers in the low country, independent Baptist preachers, they meet, and we have a, a meeting, it starts about three o'clock, and we'll go to 6 o'clock and have supper. Then we'll come back in for the night service, and they'll have another guest speak, uh, speaker for the night service. So tomorrow will be a full day, but we're excited about that. But thank you all again. We are always excited when the preacher called me coming to ask for all the preachers he knows. I really mean this. I really do. But all the preachers he knows that he would ask me to come and preach, I am certainly honored that you all would do that. Amen. All right, tonight I want you to turn to Exodus 17. And I, I'll be honest with you, I... We could get tied up with turning some scriptures, but I do believe we need to turn to them and see them to help us understand the message, amen. So if y'all would follow me in that. I, it, preacher, do y'all always stand when you read the Bible? Do y'all always stand when you read the Bible? So I'm going to ask you just remain seated tonight, and um, we're going to read our text, amen. I might not ask you to stand because this will take four hours, amen, so amen. <laughs> But anyway, y'all remain seated, and then we'll read the scripture and then give you our thought for tonight, okay? Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 in verse number 5. Verse number 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod. Notice that. Take thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. And behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of that place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Amen. And so Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. And Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of that place, or the name of the place, Jehovah Nissa. And he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I want to back up to verse number 12, if you would, verse number 12. And the Bible said, Moses' hands were heavy, and he took a stone and put it under him, and a rod there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. I want to preach on a simple thought tonight. When the rod of God is not enough. When the rod of God is not enough. 
Y'all pray with me that the Lord will help me and will touch my voice as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for letting us come tonight, Lord, and being back in church. And I'm like the preacher. I'm so glad the lights are on and people have gathered for the Sunday night service. And God, we give you praise for that. Thank you for helping us Friday night and Saturday night and then this morning and meeting with your people. I praise you for that. Please help me now, Lord. I need the clarity of mind and uh, the physical ability to relate the truth tonight. So help me to do that to the glory of God. Not here to be a performer, entertainer, but to try to deliver a message, I pray, we find lodging in our heart and bring forth fruit in our lives. For the glory of God, we pray. Amen and amen. As you look at this and we talk about the rod of God, and I trust to some degree you are familiar with the rod of God. God gave Moses back in chapter number three. I'm not turning there for the sake of time, but back in chapter number three, God gave Moses a vision. And here's what he said to him. I want you to go down in Egypt, and I want you to get my people out of Egypt. So Mo Moses had a vision. Could I put it this way? Moses was called to go into Egypt and get the people of God out of Egypt and get them to the promised land. First of all, let me say this. I believe he had a call. I believe God. I don't think Moses just chose to do that. I believe God called him to do that. Now, I, I've been preaching a little while, and I've heard great preachers, so to speak, as far as name, say they never had a call. They just started preaching, and they enjoyed it. Amen. I mean, I was listening to one man one night, and he preached circles around me, that's for sure. But he said this. I never really had a call. It's just something I wanted to do. But I believe you've got to have a call. I know God called me. If God had not called me, I wouldn't be doing this tonight. So God called Moses, gave him a vision, said, go down to Egypt, get my people out. Then he said, I'm going to use your voice to do that. In verse number, chapter 3, amen, verse number 18, chapter 3, verse number 18, here's what he said. He said in verse number 18, and they shall hearken to thy voice. Chapter 4, verse number 1. And Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. Yeah. So God, I know that's simple, but God said, Moses, I'm going to give you a vision to go down to Egypt. I'm going to use your voice to, get, to speak to the people of God and get them out of Egypt. So God gave him a voice. I believe in the communities that we live in. Amen. Here in Kaiser and St. Stephen, God calls a man, puts him in that community, and lets him lift his voice to lift up God. Amen. Matter of fact, John the Baptist said this, I was just a voice crying in the wilderness. And so he's going to use him preaching or teaching the word of God. And then he's going to lead them to victory. The Bible said get them out of Egypt and get them in to the promised land. Chapter 3, verse 17. And I, I know you might not think it's important, but it is important for the message. The Bible said, and I said, and I have said, I will bring them up out of affliction, out of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Prezerites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites. Amen. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Them termites are get you now. Amen. Amen. So my point is simply this. He said, Moses, go down to Egypt. I want you to use your voice and talk to the people and bring them out of Egypt and take them to the promised land. Yeah. So that's the call of the man of God. He's called here to this town to lift up his voice like a trumpet and call those in Egypt to get them out and get them to Canaan land or the promised land. Is everybody with me? Now listen to this. In verse 17, that's evangelism. Get them out of Egypt. But then in chapter 6, verse number 8, he tells them what? Chapter 6, verse number 8. Y'all bear with me now. He said, I will bring you in to the land. Now, in chapter six, chapter 6, verse 8, chapter 3, he's getting them out of Egypt. In chapter 6, he's trying to get them to the promised land. May I say this? Both of those things are involved in the man of God and the church that he passes and the church here, amen, Mars Memorial. We are to get people out of Egypt, and then we're to get Egypt out of people. Now, let me say this. You can preach one message and get somebody out of Egypt. But you will preach a thousand messages to get Egypt out of them. Oh, yeah. Somebody help me. Yeah, and, but that's our call. Yeah. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Right. That's what the Bible says. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end. Here's what he said. You're to go get them out of the world, and then you're to teach them what God wants them to know. Yeah. So is everybody with me on that? 
Uh, what are you saying? What, what are you trying to say? Well, the truth of the matter is, that killed Moses. Moses didn't make it to the promised land. Now, that don't mean Moses didn't go to heaven. The promised land is not heaven. The promised land is victorious Christian living. So the man of God is called in a community to get people out of Egypt and to get people, Egypt, out of people. Don't get mad at him. You didn't get mad when he got you out of Egypt. You ought not get mad when he's trying to get Egypt out of you. Somebody help me. Nobody getting that. Matter of fact, he didn't get over there far before God said, all right, Moses, I got to give you some commandments to give to the people. What is that, Lord? Thou shalt not, 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 thou shalt not. I'm telling you, he said, oh, man, Korah said, man, this is a negative preacher. Every time I go to church, it's thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. If you got anything positive to say, Moses, Oh, yeah, come back next Sabbath. I got a positive message. They all showed up next Saturday. Moses got up and preached. He said, you are positively going to hell. If you don't get, if you don't do that, quit doing them shall not. Is everybody listening? Hey, the man of God is called to get us out of Egypt and then to get Egypt out of us. Can I tell you that about killed Moses? He didn't get to the promised land. Why was that? Because the people rebelled. Is everybody listening? Amen and amen. When he, he gave him ten commandments, he, he gave him ten commandments. He, in other words, if you want to put that up to where we are, he was trying to get them out of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that's our enemy, church. Hey, once we're saved, we're going to heaven. But you go battle an enemy called the world, the flesh, and the devil that is constantly hammering on you to try to get you not to live in victory. Amen and amen. A matter over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, here's what he said about that same crowd in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. He said they were idolaters, fornicators, and murmurers. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. In our churches, we have people that come to church, amen. And I, I'm for the people of God. I love the people of God. I'm a pastor of the people of God. But we have people that come to our churches. They get saved, but they don't want to leave the world. They want to still live their carnal way. But the man of God, amen, is called to get Egypt out of us. Amen, amen. Everybody listen, amen. Do you know in the average church, and I don't consider this an average church, I don't consider our church an average church, do you know they say in the average church, 60 to 65% of the men are watching pornography. They say in the average church, supposed to be, supposed to be reliable statistics, I checked at numerous places, the average church, 65 60 to 65% of the men are watching pornography. You know why? Because the preacher ain't preaching on it. The preacher's just satisfied he's got a crowd, and he don't want to try. He likes to get them out of Egypt, but he don't want to get Egypt out of them. You better thank God you got a man of God that not only wants to get them out of Egypt, but he wants to get Egypt out of them. Is anybody listening? So, Moses, that's what I want you to do. I've called you. To go down and get them. You know what? You know what uh, Charles Wesley, John Wesley said? John Wesley said, There's no great work of God without sanctification. He said, No matter what you see in a church, there's no great work of God if it doesn't involve sanctification. He preached 40,000 messages and rode 250,000 miles on a horse and preached for, four, for probably 40 years. And here's what John Wesley said. He said, no great work of God without sanctification. I, I'll be honest, but I, at our church, it's just like y'all's church. I really believe this in spite of the preaching. I believe our church would be full every Sunday morning if we leave some things alone. Amen. People want to go to church. They like the thrill. They like the emotion. Amen. But they don't want to leave and live right. But the man of God is not called just to get us out of Egypt. He's called to get Egypt out of us. Amen and amen. So God said, Moses, that's your assignment. Go down and get them out of Egypt and then get Egypt out of them. And so God said, now I have to substantiate that I call Moses to do this. And he used that rod in about three places or four places I want to show you tonight. First of all, he used that rod in chapter 4, verse number 2. Chapter 4, verse number 2. Look with me there. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. 
And the Lord said unto him, What's in thy hand? He said, A rod. He said, Cast it down on the ground. He cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. I believe that's when Moses started stuttering. He said, and he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. And notice now, verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared unto thee. Here's what he said, Moses. I want you to take that rod, and I want you to do what I told you to do, to, to present to the people that the presence of God is with you in your ministry. Amen. Now, any man of God, God's called to do a work, and he's doing it as God called him to do it. Hey, the church is going to recognize the presence of God is with the man of God. We could all say amen to that. Hey, this church is here and is continued because God has called a man. Hey, and the presence of God has been exemplified in his life, and we can thank God for that. He said, Moses, I want the people to know that my presence is going with you. Are y'all listening to me? Amen. Bible said he picked, told him to pick that snake up by the tail. I had a friend of mine when I was a young boy. I started to say a little boy, but I've always been little. When I was a young boy, I had a boy, my man named Buddy Reeves. And Buddy Reeves came to me and he said, Alfred, now tomorrow I want to take you snake hunt. I said, what? He said, I want to take you snake hunt. I said, man, I ain't never been no snake hunt. He said, well, I'm going to fix it so they can't bite you. So he got stole pipes. And he put stove pipes on my legs, wrapped them with crooked sacks, and gave me a fork and stick. He said, now you follow me through the woods, and when we see a snake, what you got to do is take that fork and stick and put it behind his neck. I said, okay, and I'm, I wasn't praying because I was lost. I sure thinking, I hope we don't see one. And so we go tracing through, and you know my short legs, amen, I'm walking like this. <laughs> anybody listening? And so here's what I, he said, catch it behind the head. I understand that's what you're supposed to do if you're going to catch this thing. He told him to catch it by the tail. Right. I, what I got out of that, if you want a spiritual application of that, in this thing of God's work, we better stay on the tail end. Yeah. God is the one in charge. Yeah, hey, we're just, we're just called of God to do what God said. I, hey, I'm not some great person. I just have a great God. Yeah. And that great God said, I want to use you and your frailty and your weakness, and I want to show the people of God that God is with you. Yeah. Amen, amen. So he said, first of all, the people need to know that God is with you. I apologize for my voice. Second of all, I want you to take that rod, and I want you to show them that the power of God is on you. Look in chapter 14. Chapter 14. Hope I'm not boring you now. Chapter 14, verse number, verse, verse number 15. Chapter 14, verse number 15. Look with me there. And the Bible said about Moses, it said what? It said, the Lord shall fight. Well, let's back up in verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift up the rod, and stretch it over uh, stretch it over thy hand, thy hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall grow over, go over on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So next of all, he said, Moses, not only do I want them to know the presence of God with you, but I want them to know the power of God's on your ministry. He said, take that rod, and we know the story. They come out of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh and, the, uh, and the, uh, the enemy of God begin to chase them. They couldn't go to the right. They couldn't go to the left. Matter of fact, sometime a while back, I was looking that up on YouTube, a thing come up on YouTube about where they crossed the Red Sea, and it literally showed chariot wheels in that part of the Red Sea. But now, I don't need that to believe the Bible. But it substantiated what the Bible said. Now, the Bible was right whether they found it or not. But they said, they, and they showed it. They showed the chariot wheels and artifacts that was in the Red Sea, 275 feet deep where they crossed, over, where they crossed the Red Sea. And the Bible said they went over on dry ground. I believe every word of that. I believe, when, I believe when Pharaoh started chasing them that night, when they come to the Red Sea, they didn't even know they was going into the ocean. Because it was nighttime. And the Bible said the ground was so dry that it looked like a dustpan. And they run right through, and they got about halfway through or whatever, and God let the sea come back together. 
Here's what he said, Moses. I want the people to know that the power of God's with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now man can lift the rod and the Red Sea open. You know he's got power. Yeah. But I know it's God's power, but it's God's power demonstrated through him. And the Bible said when they did that and got to the other side and they saw Pharaoh and the riders were dead and the, and the enemy was dead, they started singing. As a matter of fact, they tell me that's the first time singing is mentioned in the Bible. It doesn't mean it's the first time they sang, but it's the first time it's mentioned. Amen. And the Bible said they sang, Pharaoh and the rider is dead. I would sing, but my voice is gone. Pharaoh and the rider is dead. The Lord, 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 he's a man of war. And then the Bible said, Miriam said, all right, ladies, the men have sang, let's start singing. You check it in chapter 15. And the Bible said, Miriam and the ladies started singing. Pharaoh and the writer. And the Bible said they had a, a wonderful camp meeting on the other side of the Red Sea because God had just redeemed them. Now listen to this. Do you know in Revelation 15, the Bible said when we're in heaven, we're going to sing the song of Moses. Is everybody listening? Hey, it's a redemption song, but it's a remembered song. Hey, it's been on number one on the hip parade for thousands of years. I'm glad, thank God, we're on the winning side and we have the power of God with us to accomplish what God's called us. Amen. I'm saying all this to get to my quick point. If you all help me. Then he said this. Somebody said it was 50,000 horse and riders. Josephus said it was 50,000 horses and riders. 200,000 foot soldiers that came after them that day. And God delivered them. You know why? You know why Mars Memorial Baptist Church is still here? God has delivered you. Yeah. Hey, nothing but the sheer power of God and presence of God has delivered us down through all these years. Oh, yeah. Man, I look back over Life Baptist Church, I'm telling you, and think that we're still there. It's just know that it wasn't me, it was God. Yeah, and we give him all the praise, all the glory. Yeah, yeah man. Then he said, number chapter 17, back in our text. Chapter 17, back in our text. I'm saying all this to get to my point. And the Lord said unto Moses, go before the people. Take with thee the elders of Israel, thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it in thine hand. And behold, I will stand upon there, upon the rock and hold, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. He said, Moses, I want you to show the people with that rod that through, through my working in your life that I will provide. Hey, has God provided for Morris Memorial Baptist Church in all these years? Amen. It's God did it. You say, no, it's our money that did it. I understand that. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you what. We're providentially spared and blessed because of God's presence and God's power and God's provisions in our life. Amen. Hallelujah. I can remember days at Life Baptist Church when we started. Amen. I don't know all the history of Morris Memorial. I think y'all started in that house down there. I think I heard. You can tell me after service. I remember times they would give me my paycheck and I'd sign the back of it and put it back in the offering plate. It wasn't that God wasn't supplying, it was God was testing me. But I'm telling you, thank God now, I get paid every, every, month, every, every two weeks. Amen. And God has graciously, graciously provided. And I just give God the praise. He's, he's provided for us to help other people. Like y'all were talking to Sunday school this morning. Thank God we have a God, amen, that through our ministry here at the church, that God supplies and meets our needs and helps us meet the needs of others. Amen. Isn't that wonderful to say? You know some churches just go to church and sit. Thank God that's not what this is about. We come here to worship, to leave here to do something, amen. Amen. So my point is, hey, I want them people to know that you're a servant of God that provides. Amen. I don't know if I told this story. It's in another message that I preach. <laughs> we had a man come to our home. I probably did tell it. Had a man come to our home. He was living under a bridge. And um, he come to our home. He was a notorious. And honest when I say notorious, he was well known for being a drug dealer and, and all that goes with that. He had to California, robbed his way across the country, come back, been in and out of jail, in and out of prison, and called us up one day. He said, I don't have no place to stay. I'm living on the bridge. Do y'all have a place I could stay? And so we said, yeah, we got a place. Brother Jeff said, yeah, we got a place. So he come. He got in the home. Amen. We asked him about it. Now, all this 30 years of drug dealing and all that, uh, uh, Miles, are you saved? Oh, yeah, I'm saved. 30 years, no Tory, no Tory. Oh, yeah, I've been saved. So I preached a little simple message one Sunday morning. He went to the altar, 
He got up. I looked at him. I said, Miles, did you get some help at the altar? He said, yeah, preacher, I just got saved. I said, you got saved? I thought you were saved. He said, preacher, you, you preached this morning. You can have it in your head, not have it in your heart. He said, this morning I got it transferred from my head to my heart. Amen. Thank God. Big difference, amen. amen. And so Miles got really serving God. I mean, he got excited. And so he told his brother, he said, Bubba, I've come to this home. And you know his family, he was, he was marked out of the will because his daddy wouldn't put him in the will because if he knew if he died, Miles would take the money and spend it on drugs. So he left his older brother in charge of the money. So one Sunday, his brother showed up to church. And he, and he come up to me and Brother Jeff. He said, oh, Brother Jeff, Miles wants to give you all some money. I said, what for? He said, well, he's come to this place and the home has helped him and he wants to give you all some money. I said, no, we told him that a while back. We don't want his money. We didn't get him here to give us money. We got him here to help him. To help him. So we don't want his money. He said, well, he really wants to give it. I said, well, I don't know what to say. So he said, well, he, his brother come to church that Sunday and asked me after the service was eating dinner, could he talk to me and Jeff, Brother Jeff in the office? And so we went down to the office, and he said, uh, preacher, he said, I done told you this at the table. God, Miles wants to give you all some money. Well, we were building our building then. And uh, he said, uh, he wants to give you some money. I said, well, we talked to him. We told him how we felt about it. He said, no, but he wants to give you money, so I'm going to write you a check. I said, well, brother, I don't know what else to say. He said, well, I'm going to write the check for $40,000. You got a pen? I said, oh, yeah. I got a pen. So that man sat there in my office, and he said, I'm going to add 2000 to it. So he wrote a check for $42,000. So I'm preaching somewhere, amen, and I just tell that story. I just simply told that story to magnify God, and the preacher walked up in the pulpit after I got through, and he said, you reckon a man living on the bridge could give a church $40,000? What do you think this church could do? They said, give him $40,000. Give him $40,000. I went, what, what? I went somewhere else, and I preached. I said, you are listening to an $82,000 message, amen. Is anybody listening? Hey, I'm telling you, we have a God that provides. And sometimes out of sources, you will never, never think. So here's what he's saying, Moses. I'm going to show these people that I'm with you. My presence with you, my power with you. I'm going to provide. They're going to see through you. I'm providing. Got to get an amen. I'm glad we got it. So he's doing all this to let the people know that Moses is a man of God to get us out of Egypt. Then notice this, and I, I got to hurry. Notice this. You better be careful what God gives you. You don't abuse it. Now, here's why I say that. You remember a little bit later, God told Moses to use that rod, and he said, don't, don't, don't smite the rod. Speak to the rod. And Moses used the rod and smote the rod. And God said, Moses, because of that, you're not going to the promised land. Now, I, I don't know about y'all, I wrestle with that. This man is leading two million people, murmuring, moaning, groaning, and he got aggravated. The Bible said in Psalm 106, he spoke unadvisedly with his lips. He said, because of that, Moses, you're not going to the promised land. Not heaven. I'm not talking about heaven. By the way, Moses, the Bible says, John chapter 1, I believe it is, the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Moses can never get you to the promised land. He represents the law. But Joshua got him to the promised land. And the word Joshua means Jesus. Here's what he's saying. A bunch of laws will never get you to victorious Christian living. You need grace to do that. Amen, amen. So he didn't get to take him to the promised land. But God let him see it. God let him go on the mountain and see it. So Moses was leading the people of God. The presence is there. The power is there. The provisions are there. And sometimes we better be careful what God gives us. I believe Moses went to bed at night after he threw that, that rod down and it become a snake. Can you imagine having that rod in the room with you? And you get in the bed to go to sleep, I'd probably have slept like this. Because he said, I remember when that thing become a snake. You better be careful when God blesses you that you don't abuse it. Preacher, I, I've seen God use preachers. I've seen God use people and they abuse it. Amen. I was preaching in a meeting. I was preaching in a meeting uh, somewhere. And a young preacher got up before me and preached. And I'm telling you, preacher, that man preached the house down. And I had to follow that. 
a young preacher, and I'm the old preacher. I'm telling you, he preached the house down. And I walked up in the pulpit, and while I walked up in the pulpit, he was walking down the aisle. And I said, preacher, I said, I'll tell you something, brother. You are a model preacher. He was standing in the aisle. I said, you are a model preacher. I said, everything about you, your delivery, your content, your oratorium, everything, you look like a preacher, you dress like a preacher, and that's a good idea to dress like a preacher. Yeah. And here's what he said. He, he, he looked at me, he said, thank you, preacher. And so we went up to the fellowship hall, and we were eating supper, and he come over and put his arm around me and said, preacher, thank you, pray for me. I said, I am, because God's using you. You better be careful. Amen. Do you know why we were preaching together? He was in town to preach and see another woman. I'm going to tell you what, when God gives you all this, I don't know, I might not get to the message tonight. When God blesses you and God blesses your church with his power, with his presence, with his provision, you better be careful. We better don't get puffed up. God can take it away just like he gave it. We better don't, let's let me preach here. We better don't be nonchalant, laxy daisy. We better be fired up. I like what the preacher says coming out of the prayer. Get in the choir and sing. He says that every night. Get in the choir and sing loud. Sing loud. You better, hey, give it everything you got. The world does. We ought to give it everything we got. Dear God, when you was in the world, you stay up two or three o'clock in the morning. You get up the next morning and go to work. Now if you stay up 10 o'clock, oh, I'm so tired. Somebody help me. And I know age has something to do with that. I can recognize that now that I'm a little bit older. Would y'all help me preach? Here's what I'm trying to say. Hey, be careful that rod's deceitful. It was a snake. Be careful it's dangerous. Be careful it'll destroy you. I tell you, these people handle snakes. I ain't got a lot of confidence in them. Anyway, then let me give you this real quick. Chapter 3, I won't turn there. He said, he said, Moses, I want you to be a prophet of God. The Bible said God sent Moses. That's his position. He was sent by God, but he was a man sent by God. That's his limitation. And every person that God uses is still just a man. And that's our limitation. And the Bible said now in our text tonight, when he did that, when he smote that rock and the water come out, the Bible said then Amalek came. And I love I love the way the Bible lines this up. Hey, after the smitten rock, amen, is when Amalek came. Notice this now. Well, over in chapter 16, the manna came down. That's a type of the incarnation. Then you get to chapter 17, and the Bible said, hey, the rock was smitten. That's a type of the crucifixion. And then the Bible said that the water came out. That's a type of the Holy Spirit. So when you get saved, you get God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, then an Amalek, the flesh, is going to come after you. Is everybody listening? Notice when. Notice when. Notice where it came. Deuteronomy 25, 17, it said it got those that were furthest from the leader. It got those that were at the end of the, that was at the end of the convoy. Hey, you better stay close to the leader. Amen. Is he a man? He's a man. We recognize he's a man. He has limitations. But better stay close to the preacher. Got to get an amen. Amen. So my point is simply this. What are you trying to say? I want to just look at Moses. Just give me about five, ten minutes and I'm through. I want you to look at Moses tonight as a type of pastor praying for his people. The Bible said his hands were up. Are you listening? He's got the presence of God. He's got the power of God. He's got the provisions of God. He's got the prophet of God. Does he need anything else? Yes. He needs the people of God. And the Bible said when his hands got heavy that the people of God come and held up his hands. Somebody help me. What are you trying to say? Now, I read that. If you'll read that with me tonight, look there real quick. I'm hurrying. Look, look, look real quick right there. And the Bible said in verse number 11, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, singular, that Israel prevailed. And when he let it down, his hand, Amalek prevailed. But then the Bible said in the next verse, but Moses' hands, plural, were heavy. So I don't know. You, help, you can help me after church today. How was Moses doing that? Was he holding up his hand and that would get tired and he put it down and he'd hold up his other hand and that get tired and he put it down and he, he was swapping. And so these, these men of God came to Moses and said, we're going to help you, Moses. We're going to hold up your hand. I'm going to tell you, serving God can make you weary. Serving God can make you tired. He was more tired on the mountain than Joshua was in the valley fighting. 
So they held up his hands, the maneuvering of the foe, the murmuring of the people, and Moses' hands had to be held up. I want to tell you, when we got saved, now thank God for all the joy, all the thrill, all the shouting, all the singing, all that we do in church, thank God for it. I'm telling you, church, we're in a battle. Living for God is a battle. And I don't want to preach that to discourage it, but we're in a fight. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. We are in a battle if you're going to serve God. And most people don't want to go to a church like that. I read this article. I read this article from David Gibbs. Here's what he said in regards to pastors. Said we've sent a pastors are depressed. That is what he said. I didn't say it. I took it to be reliable. 80% 80 of pastors feel discouraged. 94% of pastors' family feel the pressure of ministry. 78% of pastors have no close friends. 90% of pastors work 55 to 75 hours a week. Listen, listen, I, I, give, uh, I give you a pastor a statistic last night, this one. 10% of pastors will retire as a pastor. All the men of God that serve God, only 10% of them will retire as a pastor. Why is that? Because his hands get heavy. Are y'all with me, church? Listen to this. 7,000 churches in America will close this year. Now, you're not going to believe this one because I didn't. And I went and looked at another source. 1,500 pastors will quit every month. I said, that cannot be true. I went and checked that preacher. I found another statistic and said the identical same thing. Here's what I'm telling you. We're in a battle. I like coming to church. I like the excitement. I like the thrill. I preach on it. That's why we better get excited in church. We better get revved up. We better get revived. We better get started because you're going to walk out into a world that they ain't got what you got. And they want to do everything they can to knock the fire to you. Amen. Yeah, man, is everybody listening? So the Bible said, the Bible said, he held, they held up his hand. I found this a long time ago. I don't care how good the preacher is. I don't care how much he can pray. He can't do it all. I found I can't preach good enough. I can't pray good enough. I need the people of God. Let me give you this real quick. Who did he get? Well, the Bible said Aaron. Aaron was his brother. Aaron on one side and her on the other side. Her means noble. First time he's mentioned. I heard a preacher preach one time. I want to be like her. Is anybody listening? Hey, Aaron on one side, her on the other. Are you listening? And look what they did, and I'm through. They said, hey, we got to help Moses. We got to hold his hands up. And the Bible said in verse number 12, and they put a stone under him. I put this. Hey, they give him something dependable to lead on. Hey, I'm telling you what, if a preacher in a church needs anything, we need to lift up and depend on one another. Notice this, notice this, and I'm running through this now. Then notice this, the Bible said they put a stone. Then the Bible said he sat there on it. In other words, they said, Moses, we know you're in a battle. We know you're tired. We know your hands is heavy. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give you some rest. I see that over in Acts chapter number 16. God said, get some deacons. Somebody help me. This is not a shout message. It's just a factual message. Then you notice what it said next. And they stayed up his hands. Now, if they stayed up his hands, they stayed. They couldn't hold his hands up if it didn't stay. <laughs> Ain't that deep? The Bible said he got his hands up, and they held it up for the duration of the battle. In other words, they stayed. I could not tell you. You would never know. When the man of God looks out and sees his people sitting in their place, what it means. I'm telling you, man, if anything gets me down, it's when people leave you. I mean, I'm about going depression. And when I look out and I see, well, brother so-and-so and sister so they still there. And brother, sister so-and-so, they I couldn't tell you what that does to a man of God. Amen. Somebody give me an amen, please. I'm telling you, thank God for those who stay. Preacher, I'm telling you, 42 years, I know I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best preacher. I'm not, not even good. But I'm telling you, we've had a bunch of people leave us in 42 years. And I'm telling you, everyone, more, I've never been a preacher. A preacher look better going than coming. I'm trying to get them to come. Yeah. Anybody listen? Yeah. And I know God's got to work. I know God sometimes knows what to do better than we do. But I'm telling you, when people stay, thank God for that. Amen and amen. So the Bible said what? The Bible said they put a stone on him. The Bible said, number two, they, they sat him there on. The Bible said, number three, they stayed. 
Look at this, look at this, look at this. And then the Bible said what? The Bible said they put one on one side and one on the other. They surrounded him. Now it didn't say to put Aaron on the right and her on the left. Or it didn't say to put her on the right and Aaron on the left. I got this out of this. He didn't say Aaron. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't say to Aaron, uh, you're my number one man. In other words, he didn't create friction between Aaron and her. Are y'all listening? He just said one on one side and one. each one is just as important as the other. Let me say something to you, church. You're just as important as anybody else in this church. You're not a second rate. You might have just come in. You've been saved. You've joined up. Hey, you are just as important as anybody else. Yeah, man. The Bible said they stayed. <laughs> thank God, thank God. The Bible said they surrounded him. Thank God for the people of God that held up the hand. And then the Bible said they were steady. Look at the last part, and I'm through. And the Bible said they held his hands. They were steady until the going down of the sun. They stayed. When his hands are up, amen, hey, they held his hands up. The rod of God wasn't enough. Here's all I'm trying to say tonight. All that power, all that presence, all that provision, all that call of God is not enough if he didn't have the people of God. Amen and amen. Now, now the preacher will understand what I'm fixing to say because he, he would feel the same way. And so don't misread this. Even the preacher, don't misread this. I'm so honored to be here. I'm going to be on honor. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when I'm not with my church on Sunday, preacher, you know what I'm talking about. Dear Lord, I get homesick. Y'all see tears in my eyes? I called back home today, I said, because we had bunches of people called up, bunches of people. And they would have been out if I was there. They don't come just to hear me, I hope. And I called back home today, I said, how did the service go? How did the service go? I couldn't wait to get on. You know what I'm talking about, preacher. How did the service go? They said, preacher, we had a church full. I said, man, I know we had 40 regular people gone. We had a church full. Said we had all kind of visitors, and people said they're coming back. I said, do what? I'm going next Sunday, amen. amen. Is anybody listening? Hey, I'm just, I'm just trying to say, hey, when a man of God is called to lead the people of God, that's the burden of his heart. And yet sometimes things don't always work out like we want. Hey, but these people stayed. They surrounded him. They said, we with you, preacher. We can hold your hand. We can hold your hand up. Amen. Hey, hey, young man, could I get you to come? I don't want to embarrass you. Just come help me one minute. Just come help me one minute. This is the gist of the message. You in on it. This message is going to go wherever how you help me here, okay? And I wouldn't try to embarrass you. Here's what I'm saying. All right, you, you stand behind me if you would, okay? All right, I'm Moses. Amen. I look like you, don't I? Old to crap, isn't it? And, man, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to serve God. Amen. And Amalek's fighting this one. You know, you, I, I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass you. You know that Moses was on a hill and Joshua was fighting in the valley. Do you know Moses could see more than they could see? He could see, he could see Amalek sneaking up on them. They didn't know Amalek was coming. Oh, y'all help me. They didn't see Amalek come, but Moses had a high position, and he saw, oh, you've had to watch out. Hey, preacher, haven't you seen that in your church? Haven't you seen the flesh and the world and the devil come after me? And they don't even know it, but we know it because we have a, a higher position. I mean, elevated. And so Moses said, oh, God, the world of flesh and the devil's going to get him. Oh, man, they're such faithful people. The world of flesh said, man, I'm so tired. And here's what Aaron heard. They, they grabbed his hands. Grab my hands, Grab my hands if you would, sir. Amen. And hold them up, hold them up. Now, I want to ask y'all something. When he's holding my hands up, where's his hands? Amen. Thank you, brother. What you trying to say? Hey, when you hold a man of God's hands up, it keeps your hands up. When the man of God is fighting battles, and his, I can tell you this is true. When he's fighting battles and he comes to church and his hands is down, it'll get you down. I thank you, brother. Thank you so much. I'll give you some offering for that. How much are you charging? Here's all I'm trying to say. We've got to hold up the hands of the man of God. Amen. And by holding, I'm not just talking about the man of God. When his hands is up, our hands is up. And the church marches on. 
Praise God. And we come to church and we shout and we sing and we claim the victory because God has provided and his presence and his power shows up sometimes. Amen. 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 Oh, I'm trying to say what? When the rod of God is not enough. All he had with the rod of God was not enough. But the people of God helped him. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I need this message myself, not that I preached it. But, Lord, I'm telling you, sometimes, Lord, things happen and you don't understand. And, Lord, it just gets you weary. Then the devil attacks our body. Then the devil attacks our mind. Then the devil attacks our flesh. Lord, I pray God tonight you'd help us. Help us to stick together for the glory of God. I read where those redwood trees over in California, hey, they stand tall in storms because they're all rooted together under the surface. They're united by their root system. And Lord, help us to be rooted and grounded in you for the glory of God. Help us now. Bless the message. I pray, I pray, Lord, the Mount Mars Memorial Baptist Church, I'm, I'm not out to get an altar call and the altar to fill up necessarily for me, but I pray we'd respond and say, we're going to join hands and we're going to lift up one another for the glory of God. Bless the message now as we get ready to sing. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Musicians are coming. If they would, and play, us, play us a hymn of invitation. And maybe if God spoke to your heart tonight, you need to come and gather around the altar and say, God, help us to be all we need to be for the glory of God.